Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Emily Deacon, and I am the Director of Professional Practice for Allied Health here at the Royal. And I have the honor and the privilege to not only welcome you guys tonight, but also introduce our esteemed panel members. Um, and I want to also thank the Foundation and all of the generous donations for, to the Foundation. This is actually what's made it possible to have our regional family support program for the last couple of years. This is our second um, night like this. We had a conversations last year and it was equally well attended. So I'm so glad to see all of the enthusiasm. I want to say a special thank you to Juliet Haynes who had, uh, is responsible for all of this and also to everyone who generously donated their time and put up some great information uh, outside. So thanks to and thanks to everyone for coming. I'm going to begin now by introducing our panelists. Dennis. So Dennis Riordan is a recently retired uh, professor and associate dean in the Faculty of Computer Science at Dalhousie University. He has a long-standing interest in photography, um, and of, of note, his life has been reshaped profoundly by mental illness. He joined the Royals Family Advisory Committee and is embracing this sort of newfound knowledge and experience and finding new ways and new meaning um, as both a caregiver and a strong advocate for mental health. And next to Dennis, we have Melanie Bertron. Melanie is the mother of a child with schizophrenia and for the past 12 years has been an active volunteer and advocate for mental health. She has sat on the board of the Schizophrenia Society of Ottawa and has also served as a past president. She's volunteered for NAMI, Family to Family Education Program in Ontario since 1998, when she first established a monthly support group that is still ongoing today with the help of other NAMI volunteers. Uh, Madeline oversees the NAMI programs and trains facilitators. She teaches Family to Family course, a course that she herself took in 1998, which she credits with helping save her relationship with her son. She currently sits on the board of the uh, Mental Illness Caregivers Association. She's a founding board member. She's also retired from the public service and is said to be happy about that. <laughs> and then we have Lisa. Lisa Murata is a nurse here, um, and she works in our integrated recovery and schizophrenia program um, as a clinical nurse ed educator. She is also the clinical lead for the smoking cessation program. She graduated with her Bachelor of Science of Nursing and then went on to do a master's in educational counseling um, from the University of Ottawa. She is an RANO, so the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, that's a mouthful, uh, best practice champion. She's certified in solution-focused therapy, is a member of the Motivational Interview ne Network of Trainees. She is also a supervisory level at the Beck Institute in Cognitive Therapy. Uh, and her research interests include caregivers' experiences, smoking cessation, substance use, interventions and healthy lifestyle promotion. Um, and she's also published articles on the title model and co-authored um, a, cha a chapter on psychiatric nursing. She's passionate about person-centered, strength-based recovery care, and she works with clients and individuals, and she also works educating staff. And finally, um, we have Elise Shipper, and she is the Executive Director of the Parents Lifeline of Eastern Ontario, which is a family uh, peer organization, peer support organization, and it supports parents and caregivers of children experiencing mental health and addiction challenges. And Elise is compelled by her own family experience, and she's dedicated her career to raising the bar for youth mental health She's a passionate advocate for family-centered care. Welcome to all of our panelists. And thank you, I'd like to welcome Dennis up. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, well, very good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you, Emily, for that uh, introduction. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Juliet for, um, I guess, producing the, this evening, uh, which is a wonderful gathering of hundreds of caregivers with um, with the intention really of helping each other and I, I can feel the, the the power in the room I can feel the love in the room and uh, the determination in the room from the caregivers that I've been um, talking to so I think it's really 
uh, an, quite an exceptional evening. Um, I'm going to tell uh, you about my journey with my daughter, and in particular, uh, uh, the factors that I want to talk most about are lack of awareness and lack of empathy. And I really feel that many people in this room um, will, will have the same, uh, the same difficulties in their journeys. And uh, there's just a couple of things that I've learned that I think might, uh, might be of help to, to people. So I'll be talking about that. And I also want to talk about a bit about uh, the caregiver task, uh, the, how, how caregivers manage with this really uh, incredibly difficult uh, task that they uh, do. And then finally, I want to uh, just talk about an app uh, that we're developing. Um, so before I begin talking to you about my journey, I just want to uh, acknowledge the Royal Hospital, their Tuesday evening information and support workshops. They run for 90 minutes every uh, second Tuesday, and they run on a fall, winter, and summer schedule. And really what I'm telling, what I'm talking about this evening is mostly what I learned by attending most of those sessions over two years. So they were really wonderful sessions, and they're all attended by three really experienced mental health social workers with expertise in particular areas such as recovery that are important to all of, all of us caregivers. So now I'd like to tell you about my journey. Um, my journey begins in Africa and it begins in 1983 and it begins in a, a small town in a small hospital and I'm outside a delivery room and I say to the sister, sister, please may I come into this delivery room with my camera? And the sister says, no, you cannot. We do not allow men into the delivery room with or without their cameras. And the reason is that men faint. And then, <laughs> then we have to carry them out. And that's very hard work. That's actually what she told me. And so, um, Emily mentioned uh, photography, so I, uh, I took some amazing images, um, in, in, uh, candid images, inside that uh, delivery room uh, that you'd probably be relieved I'm not going to show you, but <laughs> because I don't want any men in this room fainting and having to be carried out. So I just want to see if I can get some of my stuff here. Um, yeah, here we are. Uh, this is where my stuff starts. So instead of showing you uh, uh, images, that, there's wonderful images that I took in the delivery room, I'm going to show you, because always pictures are worth a thousand words, I thought I'd show you, I thought I'd show you uh, this picture. And if you have a look at that, you can see uh, my daughter, and she's, she's uh, sitting in her mother's lap. And she's been taught, that they, there's a uh, teacher there teaching all the children about crocodiles. And you can see the teacher has got a little baby crocodile there, and he's exposing the teeth. And you can see my daughter's closing her eyes and looking away, because she doesn't want to look at the crocodile's teeth. And you can see the feelings in that picture of my daughter, sort of trepidation and safety because she feels that all she has to do to get out of danger is to close her eyes when she's sitting in the mother's lap. So that's, uh, I thought you'd be interested in that picture. And Africa is actually a wonderful place to begin a journey like this. Um, so now I have to tell you how I, we come from Africa to Ottawa. Well, uh, about uh, a couple, maybe two years after that picture was taken, we, uh, we came to Canada and my daughter was the youngest of four and she was protected and loved and um, settled down, ha had a really a wonderful time moving and she, she was really uh, very happy. And um, uh, after about two years in Canada, my, my wife and I separated and uh, my daughter, that's a little one sitting in the mother's lap, and the, and the one next to her is her slightly older sister, they chose to spend the next 15 years in an amazing single parenting journey with me. It was just wonderful. And so you can see that I got to know uh, my daughter 
extremely well. And so I'll just, again, a picture uh, speaks a thousand words. So 15 years later, the uh, single parenting journey ended in that way. And uh, my daughter, um, you can see the, the feelings there are confidence and accomplishment and pride. And uh, uh, soon after that, she came to Ottawa. So that's how we get to Ottawa. And she took a position um, and she worked for 12 years uh, and did extremely well and bought a house and really settled down and, um, in Ottawa. And the, uh, her mother died. And she, like an extremely you know, efficient and capable person, she looked after the funeral. And then she went back to Ottawa uh, to start working again. And then actually, uh, in the middle of the night, I got a phone call from, uh, from the airport. And um, my daughter said, uh, Dad, uh, I've come to uh, have a holiday with you. And I uh, brought my cat. And that was the beginning of this amazing marathon journey through the mental health system in, in Ontario. And marathons have always been important because I ran many marathons with my daughter. And marathon is a metaphor between her and me for discussing difficult topics um, because of the lack of awareness and lack of empathy. She has a lot of difficulty talking about issues like this and the marathon metaphor helps a lot. And you can see the determination feelings of anticipation and also marathon runners are always a little bit scared when they start their marathons. Um, then um, I want to know, uh, she, was, uh, she was discharged after 28 days, um, not at the Royal, and she, um, soon after she was discharged, uh, uh, lack of awareness and lack of empathy became really dominant factors and that, that's I think maybe the most um, important thing I might be able to tell you or that, that might help a few people. Now the, the lack of awareness and lack of empathy drove away her supporters. Uh, there are very few people stuck with her because lack of awareness makes people angry and because you know why can't you just understand you're sick and, uh, and that affects family and friends. And lack of empathy uh, makes people very, um, uh, it makes them sad, okay, because they can't, can't, can't connect emotionally with the, with the person. And they find it terribly rude. You know, why, 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 why don't you have empathy? It's, you know, it's, it's so rude. Um, so, Oh, or this lack of empathy and lack of awareness drove away her supporters and also uh, was dragging me down. And uh, so what was I to do? Well, fortunately, I was already doing probably the best thing I could be doing because I was attending those Tuesday evening workshops at the Royal. Even though my daughter wasn't at the Royal, she was um, at another Ottawa hospital. Uh, the people, anybody can go to those workshops. And, the, uh, and so I was able to uh, speak to social workers, three of them, and they told me, one of them told me that one thing you can do about lack of awareness, and I think this is very, um, very useful. You, she said that you must talk to your daughter about her feelings at particular points, like what do you feel like before this happened, and what do you feel like after this happened, and, and, how, and encourage the daughter to explore her feelings and I really and the way uh, so I knew exactly how to do this it might seem a complicated thing to do but because uh, of my uh, photography I have thousands of pictures of my daughter in different emotional type of situations and so what I decided to do was make her cards that I called amazing journey cards and these cards I would present to her, and these are two of the cards, on particular special occasions, I'd make cards like this and give them to her, and she really liked those cards. Uh, and uh, I'll just show you a few more of these cards. 
Now this was another one on a, on a journey that we took, where she uh, is showing confidence and joyfulness. She's looking for elephant, and you can, if you have a look, you won't find it difficult to see that there's a few elephants quite close by. <laughs> And, and she's not supposed to be out of her car, but at that stage in her life, you know, that was what she did. She just climbed out the window onto the roof without even getting on the, on the ground. And then there's another one, another journey that we took. And you can see that I've left in the um, happy birthday, April 2018. So that was what I gave her. I said, remember this amazing journey and love dad and just gave her that card. And then this was another card that shows agility and acceleration. And you can see her kicking hard, getting ready to go under that wave. And that's something that she, you know, she wouldn't do anymore. But it's really, I think, useful to remind her of the feelings that she had at that time. So she liked those cards. She put them on the mantle. And when I visit her, we can talk about them. I can say, well, how, how did you feel like before you were going under that wave? And, and, and I really think that those, that idea you see, this idea of uh, reminding people of feelings before and after particular points really says that it's a method of teaching uh, awareness and empathy to a person. That would be, and I think that's a pretty brilliant idea. And I know it's uh, good for teaching because um, my interest is um, computer science and machine learning, and that's exactly the sort of way we set about teaching a robot to get, uh, to get feelings. So it's really, uh, it's something that made a huge amount of sense to me and certainly helped and worked uh, on my daughter. And then there's a final um, picture that I took in Strathcona on the harvest moon under the available lighting. And you can see the feelings there of relaxation and happiness. And uh, it's really, I think it's a beautiful picture and it's romantic and I gave her that. And she enjoys looking at that picture on her mantle and talking about it with me. So then I'd like to just briefly get on to uh, caregivers. Well, I, I certainly know, okay, there's maybe 150 people in this room and every person in here is only here for one reason, and that is caregiver love. And that's the power, okay, that keeps us going with this incredibly difficult task. Um, it's a, really the only thing that keeps us can keep us going with, the, with this I mean I won't go into the difficulties because we all know it but um, and then if you think I want to say a couple of things about caregiver love because caregiver love is not quite like ordinary love caregiver love is terribly brave because we have to deal with emo emotional we know we don't get purple hearts for caregiver love but people are really really brave and caregiver love is true okay it's very hard to find true love except in this room, okay, there's uh, caregiver love, it's really true, there's nothing false, there's nothing sham about it, it's just plain straight, true love. And then resilient, okay, we just have to keep going, regardless of what happens. But the thing I most wanted to say is that caregiver love is pride. And uh, to think about that, you just have to think about the opposite, okay. If I was not proud of my daughter, she's gonna figure that out in 10 seconds. And what effect is that going to have on her self-esteem if her father couldn't be proud of her? How can she be proud of herself? How can she, uh, be, how can she feel that anybody could be proud of her? So it's really essential that caregiver, uh, caregiver love has this component of being pride. And then pride also is really an enemy of stigma. The stigma can't survive environment in which pride is, uh, pride is up and going. So then, uh, just I mentioned, I was briefly going to talk about an app. And we're we'll we in the process of designing this app. It's designed by a social scientist and a computer scientist. And the social scientist is the organizer of this evening. And the computer scientist is me. And this app is inspired by our experience, our intense caregiving experiences. And the purpose is to provide information to people who use this app, caregivers who need information at the right time. So we're working on that. And then uh, the, I guess the last thing I can tell you now is that after two years in Ottawa, I uh, came here, I uh, spent two years here, my daughter is certainly uh, improving. Okay? She's making steady, slow, 
progress. And I put a lot of that down to this idea of these amazing journey cards and other um, ideas that I learned at that at those Tuesday evening workshops at the Royal. And just to show you, I always say a picture is worth a thousand words. So here we have another picture now. And that kif, that picture shows really the progress of both the caregiver and the loved one. Okay, I took that before the leaves fell uh, in um, some way. And, uh, you know, and I can also say how proud I am of the woman in that image because of the progress that person has made. It's been quite amazing. And then we're busy working on this app and it's giving me quite a different meaning because it's a different application of some of my skills in computing. So uh, that's, and then finally, I just want to say that I've got a special wish for everybody in this room. And that wish I have uh, is caregiver love. I hope you all can get uh, caregiver love and caregiver pride. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Dennis. It's always, Dennis, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. You have such interesting and funny stories to tell. Um, before I get going on to the to topic of denial and lack of awareness, I wanted to talk to you about what NAMI is doing in Ottawa or in Ontario. So we do have a mutual support group that runs every month on a third Thursday in Orleans. Anyone who has a relative with a mental illness is welcome to attend. There's no pre-registration. We have a 10-week course that is given in Ottawa, uh, as well as other areas in Ontario. And this course teaches families the symptoms of mental illness, how to cope with them, communication skills, which is uh, life-saving skills as far as I'm concerned. It helped save and maintain my relationship with my son because before the course, I was doing everything wrong. Now I'm still doing some things wrong, but not as frequently. Um, it's offered in Ottawa each spring and fall, and there's information at one of the tables in the back. NAMI Basics, this is a six weeks course for families who have children and adolescents with a mental illness. We have two people trained in Sarnia to teach the course after they have thought it twice in that area. We'll be able to train them and they can come to Ottawa and train teachers so we can offer it here. So hopefully in two, three years, we'll be able to roll out this course to Ottawa families. The NAMI Provider Education course, so far, it's being offered in Sarnia, Belleville, and Kingston. Kingston's not written there, but they are. Like to offer it in Ottawa, but I need a medical professional to lead the team that we will train. So I'm looking for social workers, nurses, or doctors. So if you're willing to volunteer and help our community, it, it would be most welcome. So on to the topic of tonight of denial and lack of insight. Of insight. One of the most painful experiences we go through as families is watching our relatives reject the help we know they need. We don't understand why they deny that they're ill or won't go see a doctor or take their medication. And we get frustrated and impatient and sometimes angry with our relative, all of which does not help them or do us any good. There are many reasons why people might be in denial or have a lack of insight or awareness about their medical condition. So let's start first with our own assumptions, which centers around the definition of being in denial. The word denial implies that through education alone, our relative might understand their illness. They have a diagnosis. They have symptoms which are obvious to all. So why don't they get it and get on with the treatment? to feel better and, and do better in life. Well, it's not that simple. When someone rejects a diagnosis of mental illness, it's tempting to say that he or she is in denial, but in fact, they may not be thinking clearly enough to consciously choose denial. In schizophrenia, for instance, it's estimated that 40% of people are unable to understand they have the disorder because a part of the brain that is damaged is also responsible for self-analysis. It would be like asking a sick brain to diagnose itself. This is just simply impossible. There's a word for this condition, and it's called anosognosia, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's a symptom of certain mental illnesses 
perhaps the most difficult one to understand for those of us, of us who have never experienced it. What is typical of anosognosia is that self-awareness can vary over time, allowing a relative to acknowledge their illness at times and at others disavowing their illness. This variation in self-analysis is confusing to us, and we might be thinking that they're just being stubborn, but this back and forth shifting is a typical feature of an anosognosia. So let's talk about some of the other reasons why people may have denial or lack of insight. Medication effects like weight gain or sedation can be very troublesome for some people. Others may fear becoming dependent on medication or addicted to them. Encourage your relative to talk to their doctor about their concerns. Dosage can be ad adjusted or other medications may help. Resistance to illness role. Taking medication or going for treatment is a daily reminder of what they have, what they have lost, and what they face in their future, especially when they see their friends go on and live their lives. Some people don't want to deal with the pain of this realization. Delusions. Some people may have paranoid thoughts that the medications are poisoning them or making them ill. Cognitive problems such as confusion or disorganization or memory problems. Cognitive behavior therapy, for instance, can help alleviate some of the cognitive symptoms. Poor doctor-patient relationship. If your relative does not like their doctor, it can influence their attitude towards treatment. Help them find a different doctor or help them communicate differently with their doctor. Shame or stigma about having a mental illness. Some people believe that having a mental illness is a character flaw. And we need to challenge that and tell them that it is a legitimate medical illness which requires treatment, just like diabetes or a heart condition. Depression. They may not care about getting well or seeking help. So what can families do? Stay healthy. Look after yourself because you can't help anyone if you're burnt out or feeling overwhelmed and at the end of your rope. Get help when needed. We expect our relative to reach out and get professional help to help them with their symptoms. Well, we need to get professional help as well if we need it, so don't hesitate to reach out. Learn about your relative's illness. Attend support groups. Take the NAMI Family to Family Education course. Attend sessions here at the ROH like you are doing tonight or at the Oasis in Canada. Learn as much as you can and talk to other families. We understand what you're going through because we've been through it and we can help. Knowing that you're not alone in this journey can be life-saving and you may find that you're more on track than you realize. Learn about the LEAP approach by Dr. Xavier Amador, author of I Am Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. In his book, he describes this approach very in great detail. LEAP is short for listen, empathize, agree, and partnership. Learn about motivational interviewing. I won't get into that because Lisa, our next speaker, will be discussing it at length. Acceptance. This is probably not what you want to hear. There's no magic formula to get your relative into treatment or accept medication or even one to get better. So you have to accept the fact that your relative does not view his or her illness the same way you do. And then you let it go. As a parent, this is very hard to do and sometimes heartbreaking. After all, we want them to have the very best in life. But your adult children have the right to choose to live their life the way they see fit, as long as they're not hurting themselves or someone else. It's going to be a long and difficult journey, so it helps to manage our own unrealistic expectations that they accept their illness, and this will make the trek a little, little easier. Don't be discouraged. Just because it's taking a long time doesn't mean that recovery won't happen. And I'm not addressing here situations when there is violence, when there's a possibility of them hurting themselves or someone else. In these situations, you don't hesitate, and you either bring them to an emergency room or you call the police if you have to. 
love acts. Work on improving your communication skills through the use of I statements, where we make requests or express our feelings without judgment or accusation, and using reflective responses to focus on what our relative is feeling and experiencing and validating them. It helps. We spend one full class in the NAMI Family to Family Education course to learn these two communication techniques. I credit this class with helping save and maintain the good relationship that I enjoy with my son even today, after almost 23 years of illness. Having lost contact with my son for six months when he was ill and living on the street before he was diagnosed, we didn't know what was happening, I don't want to live through that nightmare again. And I tell families to stay in contact with their relative no matter what. Always keep the door communications open. The unconditional love and unwavering acceptance you, accept to, you, ex, you extend to them will allow your relative to reach out to you when they're ready for help. We can't force someone to accept and acknowledge their illness before they are ready. What we can do is accept the situation for what it is, continue to love and support them, and to be ready to fight for help and support our relative in whatever way they need when they finally see that they need help. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lisa for a motivational interview. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out, and uh, thanks to Juliet for inviting me. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you a little bit about um, motivational interviewing, and it's really just going to be a taste because I only have 15 minutes. So we're going to try to talk about uh, what actually is motivational interviewing because um, it has various definitions, but what really is it? What's the spirit of it? And what, what does that mean? And then give you a little uh, exercise to do. So. Um, at the end of it, we'd hope that you'd be able to explain or see how it might be helpful in working with your uh, loved ones. So here is an example of a, a brief description. You should be able to tell anybody uh, something within the time it takes you to go from one floor to another in an elevator. So this is a am I in an elevator speech. A method of communication designed to bring out the other person's motivations to change. And it's a particular way of having a conversation where the person starts to argue for the change and not the caregiver or the clinician. So really, it's uh, like entering someone's home. You wouldn't enter in their home and tell them how to rearrange their furniture. Hopefully not. Um, you would enter with uh, respect, interest, kindness, affirm what is good, and uh, not criticize. So it's a person-centered way of communicating. And it really is a guiding method. So we're not trying to um, confront people or make them change. And we want to elicit their strengths in doing so. So really, it uh, increases the probability of change uh, in whatever way you're using it. So it's been used in many different realms. Um, and it's not the only thing that exists out there, but it makes other um, methods or even uh, theories or uh, ways of working with people better. So it's kind of been described like the Swiss Army of counseling. Something to put in your pocket that will help your other, um, whatever modalities you're using work better. So in terms of working with families, um, we have uh, some research that shows when we um, work uh, with caregivers, we can help people to actually um, maybe uh, reduce their alcohol and drug use, uh, to um, attend appointments, to um, commit to healthy lifestyle behaviors. Uh, so it's uh, very helpful for any kind of time where you want somebody to change their behavior. And uh, in this article, we see uh, that it was taught to family caregivers uh, working with their young adults who had just been diagnosed recently with schizophrenia who used uh, cannabis. And um, through a series of workshops teaching, uh, they were actually able to see a change in the kinds of conversations uh, the caregivers were having with their family members. 
and the family members um, changed their behavior in terms of their use. So after uh, three months, the uh, cannabis use had decreased and um, also that the uh, parents or the caregivers were able to show an increase in empathy. And they actually measured it by having conversations with caregivers and um, a, an actor playing the child um, recorded and coded. In MI, we do a lot of coding. That's to make sure that the, what you're doing with somebody is actually motivational interviewing. Because a lot of people can say they do motivational interviewing, but until you've actually had your uh, transcript a conversation coded, you don't really know that that's true. And MI is very non-confrontational, so it uh, really is a way of uh, overcoming resistance. And um, unlike the Borg in Star Trek, resistance is futile, they say, um, it increases the likelihood of, of change. There was another article uh, uh, by uh, Baraclaw and uh, all where they did CBT, MI, and uh, family intervention for people with substance use disorders, also successful, um, superior to standard care. And then there's another myriad of articles around uh, using it with people who have schizophrenia. So what is uh, MI spirit? Well, we can talk about partnership. We can talk about um, the ingredients, uh, empathy, um, and they actually they spell the word pace or cape, uh, compassion, empathy, partnership, acceptance. So we're going to do a, a brief um, exercise if you if you guys are okay with that. Yeah. Um, I want you to get into pairs or triads with whoever you're sitting beside, if you don't mind talking to that stranger, or hopefully it's maybe it's not a stranger, maybe it's your husband or wife, uh, partner. Um, and we're going to think about right now, uh, so the person, uh, everybody in a pair? Does anybody not have a pair or a grouping of a trio? Now, I want the person with the nearest birthday to today is going to pick a something that they want to change but haven't done so yet. So something that you'd like to change in your life that you don't mind talking to your partner about, um, just for a few minutes. All right, so we've identified birthday person. All right. So the birthday person is going to talk about a change. The person whose birthday is farthest away from today is going to follow the directions on the screen. So if you're talking about your change, try not to look at the screen because that's the instructions that your uh, partner's trying to follow. OK? Everybody ready? I'm going to give you four minutes. OK, go. Four minutes. All right, so if you were the person talking about your change, now you can read what your partner was trying to do. Ah, yeah. Uh, so people are talking about their change. How did that feel? It felt what? Sorry? Unhelpful? How, how did you feel about getting that advice? Awkward. Like you were being controlled? Yeah, Sharon? Diminishing the problem. Yeah. So, um, and people who are trying to follow the directions, how did that feel for you? Yeah, so you didn't even want to do it. You were like, oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was against your training. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't even follow the directions. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. That wasn't the point of the exercise was to show you what MI is not. So um, we call this the writing reflex, and the writing reflex, just like you see in the picture, like a picture is like Dennis was saying, it's worth a thousand words. We try to, when we're faced with something that we think we can fix, or uh, somebody's come to us and they need to change. We try to tell them what to do a lot of times. And um, if you have a teenager, um, like I do, you know that that doesn't work. Yeah. So normal responses, angry, irritated, you know, defensive, feeling uncomfortable and ashamed, awkward, uh, powerlessness, like you're being 
up, down, discouraged, disengaged. So not what we, not what we think would be helpful for change, right? All right. So now we're going to do the exercise using motivational interviewing. So you're going to use a, you're going to have a little taste of MI. So I'm going to ask you uh, to uh, switch partners. So the person who is talking about the change now is going to be the helper, and the person who was helping before is now going to talk about their change. Again, something that you feel comfortable talking to your partner about, something you haven't changed. You're thinking about changing, but you haven't changed yet. All right. I'll give you five minutes again. All right, and uh, you can both look at the screen. It's not a big deal. <laughs> okay, stop. Uh, so, uh, what what was that like for people? How did that feel? Awesome. <laughs> okay, for people who are talking about their change, what else? How else did you feel? Yeah. Oh, nice. A platform, so you could go on, and you didn't feel like you're being told. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Nice. Empowerment. Yeah, awesome. Well, it's fitting that this is a conversations, right? Conversation of the royal? Yeah. Oh, so you actually got to go through some feelings. Yeah, movement. Yeah. Uh, if they're not, like, answering your questions or, yeah, well, um, we, call, we call that resistance. And we, and we would... <laughs> We would roll with resistance. So there are, like, we only have 15 minutes, so I can't do much more than this. So uh, we are planning to do a full day workshop for caregivers uh, coming in the spring. So uh, I can talk to uh, Sheila Dayton at the Schizophrenia Society. Her extension is 7775, uh, if you want more information about that. OK. So how do people feel? They feel engaged. They feel empowered. They feel open and understood. And uh, it's a funny thing when people are asked about, uh, would you rather work for change or just complain? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's been said that advice, unsolicited advice, is junk mail of life. And sometimes advice is what we ask for when we already know the answer, but wish we didn't. <laughs> So really, uh, motivational interviewing is about dancing, not wrestling. So if you get anything from tonight, oh yeah, am I? Dancing, not wrestling. Um, and it's been said that am I, uh, learning am I is a lifelong process. It's like learning a musical instrument. It takes um, lots of practice and uh, you know, a commitment. So um, thank you very much for your attention. and. Uh, I really appreciated your um, enthusiasm and engagement in the exercise. Hi, I'm Elise. I'm the executive director at Clio. Um, and I have a few things I want to talk to you about tonight. Some of them echo what we've already heard. Um, I've learned a few things and, and will maybe try to adjust my presentation on the fly to incorporate them. Um, but I'd like to tell you quickly about Clio first for two reasons. The first is I, I think it's helpful context for everything else I'll speak about tonight, knowing that these ideas come from almost 20 years of collective wisdom from parents and caregivers like yourselves, and also because 15 minutes isn't quite long enough for me to best address each of your individual stories. And I want you to know that Clio is here for you beyond tonight. Um, beyond this evening and any time to help you answer this and any other question. Almost 20 years ago, a few moms found themselves informally supporting each other in a hospital waiting room when their children were having mental health crises. They were sharing valuable insider information, tips and tricks, um, and the camaraderie of peers who understand what you're going through and are right there alongside you. Leo's grown tremendously since then to work with families and service providers throughout the region. So our family peer supporters, parents who have and are supporting their own children with struggles through mental health and addiction, provide help, guidance, system navigation, and support to other parents through three main services to help families find their way forward. We have a parent helpline Monday to Friday from nine to seven, 18 support groups across the region, and a one-on-one -on -one mobile support service. 
we've been there, we get it, and we can help. And we know that what we're offering is working. Close to 90% of the parents we support report being better able to access the right services, better able to support their child, better able to cope with challenges, that they feel less alone, less isolated, and less stressed. So at any time, you can just pick up the phone and call us. There's no wait list. You don't need a referral. You don't need a diagnosis. You can just call. And we're also really happy to make that first call if that helps in any way. So you can just find myself or Natalie, who's sitting up there raising her hand after the presentation. Um, just give us your name and your number. We'd be happy to call you. The question I'm speaking to tonight, uh, ways to support loved ones in getting help when they're ready including options when the right resources are not available, is kind of the million dollar question. Um, when I started working on this presentation, I almost regretted agreeing to do it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a tremendous challenge with mental illness when the symptoms of the illness are also the barriers to getting, getting better. So lack of insight, denial, paranoia, inability to advocate for oneself or think clearly, total hopelessness, a lot of the things we've heard about tonight it makes it really hard, if not impossible, for your loved one to get themselves to the help they need without support, the critical support that parents and caregivers like you can provide. So I want to talk first just for a minute about what ready means, because given all of those common and known symptoms of mental illness, it's unlikely that ready is going to look like your loved one coming to you and saying, hey, mom, I need some help. Can you give me a ride to the Royal? <laughs> It's more helpful and realistic, I think, to think of it as a window of willingness and a process. Being willing to walk in the door is ready. It's not necessary for your loved one to have 100% buy-in, to know what all of the challenges are, to have a clear vision of what the future could hold if they get help. It's not even necessary for them to say, I have an illness. I need help specifically for that. So just getting in the door, going to a first appointment, being willing to explore getting help or getting, being, becoming engaged in some kind of service is ready. It is the first step. And a month later, when they're willing again to explore a little further, it's more ready. It's a process. A really good question to ask and one that's been answered in part tonight with motivational interviewing and some of the other tricks we've learned is how to help create that window of willingness and how to support that process. So I have four ideas to share with you about the first part of this question, about how to support a loved one to get help when they are ready. And the first, the first idea is to plan ahead. Do your research and seek guidance about what the best options for help are. And when you have identified those options, find out what the intake requirements are. What does ready mean to them? Ask that question. What will you expect from my loved one to get help from you? Does he have to be sober for some amount of time prior? Does she have to agree to a whole program or can she just come to a first appointment? It's really important information to have to help ensure that when you do arrive, you're not turned away. Find out what the admin requirements are for intake, the forms that need to be completed, the documentation you'll have to provide so that you can prepare in advance. Find out if there's a wait list and get on it now. If your loved one becomes interested or willing at some point, you don't want to arrive there just to discover that there's five years before you can get in the program. Ask about what the intake process will look like so that you can prepare yourself and your loved one in advance to help make the process go as smoothly as possible. Is the parking situation going to be so complicated but that by the time you find a spot, your loved one will have changed their mind? Maybe it's better to just take a cab or get a ride. Will you need a support person there for yourself because you're worried you'll change your mind once you get halfway through the process? Will they ask your loved one difficult questions that you can prepare them for? Is it a program that will have some restrictions for what your loved one can and cannot bring with them that needs some consideration in advance? The idea is to walk yourself through the process and do it with someone who's been through it before so that when the moment arrives, you're not scrambling to figure it out, you can just go. The second idea is to consider how you can provide and receive information about your loved one. And this is likely going to require some advocacy on your part. Ideally, the service provider has a full history, the context, everything you know and continue to witness about your loved one for the 23 hours outside of the appointment time. Ideally, your loved one talks to you about the treatment plan. 
They share pertinent information with you, like what they're trying to do at home and outside of appointments, what safety risks they've identified, what coping tools they're learning, what medications they're taking, so that you can help manage contraindications, help watch for negative symptoms, critical information that you need to support them knowledgeably when they need it. So if you can, speak with your loved one about how their information is private and how allowing for some information to be shared with you helps you best support them. Ask that they explicitly tell their service provider about what kind of information can be shared with you. Treatment plan, medications, what approach or tools are being used. They can provide permission to share this information in you, with you and also have any details of the discussion remain private. This kind of privacy conversation will likely not happen by default. So it can also be really helpful to ask the service provider to have this conversation with your loved one, to encourage them to keep you their main support person informed just on critical stuff. And if your loved one says no, ask your service provider to revisit this conversation with them another time and another time. An intake in psychosis may not be a time when your loved one is willing to say yes. A few days later, when they've settled and are seeking your support, the answer may change. As a parent or caregiver, you are an expert in your loved one. You hold incredibly valuable information that will make the outcomes for your loved one better if shared with your service provider. You hold the baseline for what your loved one is like when they're well. You know the history of what has worked or not, what has been a trigger, what the patterns and symptoms are. You may not be asked to share this, and you can ask for and advocate for that opportunity, and on a regular basis. Even if your loved one has not consented to sharing information with you, you can still provide information. You can put it in a letter, ask for meetings, ask for five minutes at the beginning of an appointment. There are a few excellent guides on privacy and consent that you can find through the Change Foundation, which I encourage you to look up, or again, you can find myself or Natalie afterwards, we'd be happy to send it to you. The third idea is to ask your loved one what support would look like for them and check in about it regularly. And the goal here is open communication. Things like, I'm here for you. I want to support you in this, but can you help me with some ideas about what that might look like? Is this working for you? Are there ways you'd like me to support you that I'm not, or that you'd like me to change? We do the best we can with our loved ones, and the way we offer support may not feel helpful. Sometimes they just want you to sit on the floor beside them while they cry and not say anything. Sometimes they want you to help problem solve. And sometimes you don't have capacity for one or, or the other, and that's okay too. But have the conversation. And the fourth idea, which we've already heard tonight, is to get some support for yourself and to do your own work. The real and significant effect that your loved one's illness has on you, the way you will be in relationship with them going forward, how you have your own boundaries, seek some help to address these through support groups, with a counselor, through evenings like tonight, whomever and whatever works for you. It's an important part of taking care of yourself and it's an important model for your loved one. The change that you experience from getting your own help will have ripple effects with your loved one and the rest of your family system. Because when you change one part of the system, the rest changes too. The second part of the question we're discussing, discussing tonight is finding options when the right resources aren't available. There are real challenges to getting your loved one the help they need. Maybe the type of service doesn't exist in your area, the wait list is too long, you don't meet the eligibility criteria because of age or multiple diagnoses. You could likely each add something to that list from your own experience. And you're not alone in these challenges. I am optimistic about the momentum for change to the mental health system, but let's talk about what you can do now within this reality. I think it's helpful to have a quality of life perspective. And by this, I mean to think of health as the World Health Organization defines it. Not only the absence of infirmity and disease, but also a state of physical, mental, and social well-being. And they further define it by looking at these different aspects, these different buckets of areas that contribute to your health and well-being and a good quality of life. When you looked at, look at your loved one's quality of life through this lens, it's easy to see how mental health or addiction challenges can affect all of these buckets. She can't hold a job or he's failing at school. He stays completely isolated at home and has no friends or community. 
She's hopeless and can see no wonder, no meaning, no purpose, no future. He's given up on any grooming, has gained a dangerous amount of weight, can't be motivated even to walk around the block. But this means that there's also opportunity in each of these buckets. Opportunity for your loved one to feel some momentum, to gain some confidence, some hope, to engage, to expand their world a little. Which brings me to my idea that the right resources aren't just clinical. They aren't just the hospitals and treatment centers. I'm not suggesting you substitute those services. They are a critical piece of the puzzle. I'm suggesting that there are lots of opportunities, lots of pieces of the puzzle, and that any one of them will help your, help your loved one find their way forward. You can look for programs and services. There are recreational and social programs, employment and skill building programs. There are also lots of out of the box ways to address any one of these buckets. Maybe there's someone who's willing to come over at the same time every week and go for a walk with your loved one. Someone who can expand their circle of support and their connection to the outside world. There are also things that may be considered alternative where families have found really positive impact, getting diet or nutrition support, for example. Maybe you can convince your loved one to regularly go for a swim with you or walk the dog or get a personal trainer. Maybe there's a drop in music or art class they could join. The way you imagine your loved one's life, the way they may be imagine it in a perfect world, probably includes a lot of these things. You don't have to access that clinical resource first before any of these buckets are addressed. And momentum in any one of them can have a ripple effect that may help your loved one find their way forward. When lack of access, wait times or distance, for example, are a barrier to the right resource, there are some options. There are families who find out of province or out of country services. There are private services if you can find a way to afford them. Some have sliding scale or bursaries or may be covered by benefits. There are creative ways to fill the gap, even if temporarily. Hiring a private occupational therapist to come to your home while you're waiting to access a program, for example. Depending on what you're looking for, there are also online resources. There are ways for you or your loved one to connect to clinical help online or other resources online. Support and educational groups, books, tools you can use at home. Speaking with peers, other parents and, great, and caregivers is a great way to find out about some of these options, the things that you might otherwise not know about. And calling Clio, that's exactly what we're here for, that kind of information. I hope one or two of these ideas resonates with you and that you can leave here tonight feeling like you have another piece of the puzzle. There is hope. There is always a way. There is always something. And you're not alone. You don't have to figure this all out alone. We are here for you. I think that you're here is already momentum. We know that someone struggling with mental health will have better outcomes when they have support. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being there for them. Thank you, Juliet, for organizing.